Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can I give you a great uh, warm welcome to our time together, particularly of welcoming for a visitor among us. We're going to kick off at 11 o'clock, and I know there'll be still some people gathering together with us uh, as the minutes go by. But it's important we make the most of the time that we have uh, in God's presence together. Um, a bit of a regular welcome is when we say, to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a saviour. But well, we open our hearts and the doors of our church to you this morning and uh, give you a warm welcome from the Lord Jesus himself. We're going to come before the Lord in worship, uh, particularly around his word and around the table of the Lord and in song. Uh, before we do that and before we start, set off with a little reading from scripture, if you want to turn to it now, you can. Uh, turn to Hebrews in chapter 3. But I'll just uh, get rid of, dispose is the proper word, of the notices. Please make sure you take one of our bulletins away with you today. It has um, our services uh, or our activities through the week. Uh, it's also available online as part of our WhatsApp group and uh, eventually on our Facebook group. So if, uh, so if you're not part of that, please let us know and we can add you. Um, also, if you're not on our church mailing list, because we mail this around as well, and I don't mean physically, I mean by email. If you're not on our church mailing list and you don't receive one of these by email, as uh, soon in the week as I can probably rem remember to do it, please uh, let either myself or Alice uh, have your email and we can add you to that and you can get not only this, but uh, various other things that we pop around by email. Uh, just to note, there's a couple of things, and I know I'm going to disappoint a couple of people today. But I might as well get the disappointment over now, and then we're, and then we're, and then we're sorted. Um, there is no Bible study this, this next week. Oh, oh come on. Gary, that's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see what I see what I'm talking about. No, um, I, I, I announced last week that um, there is a Christian Institute meeting this Thursday up at Hensingham. And when we do, we do them, uh, they do one and then we do another say a, a year apart. And when we do ours, we expect them to come yeah. and support us. So it's only right and ethical that um, you know, a few of us, if we can, go and support that. So that'll be on Thursday. I will, I will suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune because of that decision, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure we tea through the week will be cold and all that sort of stuff. But we will be back in Bible study. And if you haven't joined us in our latest study, we haven't got that far. We, 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 <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't. We, we've only got two verses into two John. We've been going, we've been going four weeks. We've got two verses in, so you can easily catch up. So if you'd like to join us, um, but as I said, we do have our reading group. We do have our um, prayer meeting. The uh, the church is open in the week. If you'd like to come down for a cup of tea or a meal, uh, thank you by the way for all those who came to table talk last week. Um, which is a, sort of a new ministry uh, where we're meeting together for lunch on a Wednesday uh, every so often. Thank you. Um, we'll, the idea was to do it monthly for a couple of months just to see how it goes and then, and then if, if we've got enough people to increase it to fortnightly where we get together, we talk about Jesus and we have a, just have a, a bit of a soup and a sandwich together. And uh, So we'll see how that goes but we'll hope to increase the frequency of that as we can. Okay. Um, I think, just one more notice from me, and then we'll crack on. Just, and it's not really from me. It's the announcement of an engagement and birthday party. Uh, it's not mine, by the way. <laughs> um, 34 years? Still can't believe it. Love every time I look in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> I was six when I got married in case you were um, um, No, it's from, it's from our dear brother, Paul Mack. Okay? So everyone is invited to the Marchand Club on the 19th of March. At seven o'clock uh, for his birthday party and the engagement party. Ooh, ooh uh. so you can ask me about that later. And uh, just a note, it says, "Can you please let Alice know?" And, you, and and there's a deadline. Can you please let Alice know by next Sunday if you're planning to attend? So we'll probably put it on um, online uh, during the week to remind folks. But it, but if you can and you want to go along to that, um, please please uh, keep that in mind. Okay. Let's turn to Hebrews and chapter 3. Oh, I should say, after the service today, there's going to be tea and coffee. Um, so please feel free to join us for that.
Okay, that's our call to worship this morning. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 14. Now you might think this is a really strange call to worship. It's a really strange passage to start with. But bear with me, okay? And we do this so that we remember that as we've come out and as we've joined a congregation this morning, we do that in response to God himself calling his people to worship him. So this is what Hebrews says therefore holy brothers you who share in a heavenly calling consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses was also faithful in all of God's house for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. An encouragement and a bit of a warning for us that as we gather together that we are to gather correctly we're to gather in faith with a point if you like our faith again toward Jesus we're to look and consider him who was faithful how was Jesus faithful in all his life in all his ministry in all his works in his life in his death in his resurrection and even today he remains faithful from the basis of his intercession he carries on thinking and uh, thinking and praying for us until we are gathered to him, until the fullness of all things. So as we've gathered together, we're going to rise together and we're going to pray and then we're going to sing in response to God's call. We want our hearts to be right before God. We want our hearts to be right with each other and we want to hear what God has to say to us in his word and we want to demonstrate the grace of God even as we break bread together later on. So let's stand together. And again, let's begin, as we've heard the word read, let's begin to worship the Lord in our hearts, to focus upon him. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again on this first day of the week. We thank you for the privilege of being together. (coughs) We thank you, Lord, that you have done everything, Lord, for us in terms of our salvation. We don't have to worry about being acceptable to you in in that we have put our faith in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we approach you today according to your word. We approach you on the way that you've opened for us, that we might come and praise and glorify and worship you. We thank you for the promise that you've given us in Christ. Lord, we thank you that as your word declares, Lord, that promise is everlasting. It is unbreakable. It's based on the goodness of your grace. It's based upon the faithful obedience and the perfect accomplished work of Jesus on the cross. Lord, as we gather, we ask that the spirit who indwells us, Lord, would would even help us in our worship. Help us this morning. Lord, even as we hear your word, to be further transformed and changed as we've gathered in your name and as we gaze upon your loveliness. Father, we ask this. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord for a moment or two, friends. Just in our own hearts. Maybe one or two would like to lead us before we come to God's word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you, we can come to a good and gracious King this morning. We thank you, Lord God, that we can come, Lord, just as we are. Yeah. Lord, we don't need to put on airs or graces, because you accept us for who we are, for what we are, Lord God. And you take us in your arms, and you are the one, Lord, that changes us. You are the one that provides for us. You are the one that gives us all that we need. And Lord, we can only praise and thank you for that this morning. Lord God, we thank you that we can come and enter into your throne. That we don't need to come through an intermediary this morning. We can walk directly into your presence. Because you are there with your arms open wide. Lord, whatever our needs are, whatever, Lord, we are coming with this morning, our burdens, Lord, we can bring them straight to you and lay them at your feet. And Lord, you take them up and you bear them on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. Just, Lord, as you bore our sin on the cross, Lord, when you stretched out your arms and said, this is how much I love you. And you stretched out your arms and you bled and you died. That we might be forgiven. That we might be set free from our sin, from our burden. And we are not the finished article yet. Until we see you face to face, Lord, we just want to praise and we want to worship you. Give you the honour and the glory that you so deserve for all that you have done for us. Lord, you are a good and gracious King. And we thank you that we come only by grace. It's only by grace that we can enter into your presence. And we thank you that you have called us and that you have chosen us, Lord. And that your blessing rests upon us, oh God, this morning. And we just pray, oh Father, that Lord, that you will have your way, Lord, in this place this morning. That we will hear your voice. That Lord, we will hear what, Lord, you have to say to us this morning. And that Lord, that we won't just be hearers of that word, but we will be doers. And that Lord, we will go out of this place today rejoicing, having been in your presence having been together with our brothers and sisters, sharing worship, sharing around your word, coming around your table to be blessed. Lord, we just thank you this morning that we have the freedom and the liberty to be able to do that, Lord. And we just say thank you. Lord, accept, Lord, our humble praise and worship this morning as we kneel before your throne. Thank you, Lord. Been encouraged in song to focus on the Lord Jesus, despite sometimes the afflictions and the trials that this life, this life brings us, knowing that God, in His mercy, supplies our needs. In that first song, we heard you know, that phrase that as your days, your strength will be. In other words, that by God's supply, we have all that we need to cope with the struggles of the day, that our strength will re remain undimmed while there is work to do for the Lord. And it reminds me of what, what's said in Deuteronomy 34, which we'll come to later on in um, a few moments, about Moses. You know it well, of course, that when in Deuteronomy it's, it talks about his death, then in verse 7 it talks about Moses and says, Moses was 120 years old. That's Moses, not Alan Telford. <laughs> Moses was 120 years old when he died. So he's still got a way to go, yeah, Alan. Okay. And it says his eye was undimmed and his vigour unabated. Uh, one of the older versions says his natural force unabated. What did that mean for Moses? Did it mean he could um, do cartwheels? Well, possibly he could have done, who knows? But it meant that whatever the task God had for him up until that day, God supplied his need to be able to meet the challenge. And of course, we know the challenge as we'll come to Exodus in a minute that Moses had. Well, Moses acts as a picture. He acts as a great picture of Jesus in terms of his faithfulness, as we read 
in Hebrews 3. But he acts as a, an example to us too. Not an example that we have to be as strong as Moses, but an example in the fact that because God was faithful to Moses, so we know because of his love for us, he will be faithful to us. And he will supply the strength that we need. We're going to come to God's word. And, but it's right that before we do that, that we remember not only God's love, not only the joy that he gives us, but we remember the times, perhaps during this week, that where we have failed him. And we'll, we'll, we'll share an act of confession and a prayer together. We do this so that as we approach God's words, our hearts will be clean and ready to hear. So as we pray, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Father, we thank you that you are a God of supply, a God of strength, a God of sustain, a God that sustains us. But Lord, we also thank you that you're a God of mercy and grace. And Lord, as we've heard prayed, Lord, we stand before you solely on the ground of that unmerited favour. And Lord, we need your grace today, even as we've needed it every step of the way, and even as we will need it. Lord, because you recognise that even, even today, even this week, in our homes, in our jobs, in our relationships, in our thoughts, in our actions, there have been times when we've failed you. So we ask again, Lord, as we come to your word, that you'd be merciful to us, that you'd forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our failures, forgive us of our willfulness, forgive us sometimes of our slowness of heart to believe your promises. Lord, restore to us even now, Lord, the joy of our salvation. Lord, we desire to be ready to hear you speak. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please turn with me then to Exodus and chapter 40. He, speaking and hearing God's word is an essential part of our worship. We're going to sing again in the light of what the Lord says to us from his word. As, as, as we look to approach the table. But we hold the scripture very highly here and we do that unashamedly we do that without apology and without exception we believe that as the bible speaks god speaks and god speaks to his people and as we come week by week the important thing is that god's word is proclaimed before his people this is what exodus 40 says the Lord spoke to Moses saying, On the first day of the first month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall put, in the, put it in the ark of the testimony. And you shall screen the ark with the veil. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and set, it, set up its lamps. And you shall put the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony. And set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. And you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so they may become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put it in its poles and raised up its pillars and he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle. And he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing which, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the, the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. The Lord add his blessing to his word. The last chapter. We set off our, in our journey, if you can remember, midway through 2019. So it's taken us longer to get through the book than it has the, 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 the children of Israel to get out of Egypt and to set up the tabernacle. But that's life, isn't it? I know many of you, many of us perhaps, uh, for many of us I should say, last Christmas is fast fading from our memories and our minds. You know, we're already progressing to the end of what is the first month of another year, 2022. And again, as we go through the week ahead of us, we've got some more issues to navigate, haven't we? We've got all the things we normally do. We've got home and work and relationships and, and finance and all those sorts of things. We've also got to navigate to, again, again, some changed requirements as to the current COVID um, variant and, and, and the pandemic, uh, the wearing of masks, after Thursday will be will move from a requirement in public places to a recommendation. So, so next Sunday you won't have to wear a mask, but we will still recommend because there's a few of us in here. If you want to, that's absolutely fine. And, and whether you do or you don't, we treat each other with kindness. We treat each other with grace. We treat each other with respect. But before we forget Christmas, at least altogether, before we forget those last few days of 2021, I want, if you're able, to cast your mind back to your preparations for Christmas. Or indeed, if you like any past Christmas that um, you prepared some gifts or you got some gifts or gifts were exchanged. Not to remember the gifts themselves or in the sense the joy you felt, although that's good, or even the faces of your loved ones, but rather, in a sense, I have a solemn duty today because I want to remind you of one of the most frightening some of the most frightening words in the English language that we that we often come across when we're approaching Christmas you may have, have heard these you may have seen these written down you may have encountered this horrible phrase when you've received a gift or you're preparing a gift for someone else I know some of you will be a little bit worried where I'm going with this and some of you maybe get knowing where I'm going, I get a bit frightened, but don't worry, God is gracious. Do you remember those, those, dreaded word, those dreaded words that have cast fear into generations? You know the words? Some assembly required. <laughs> it might not frighten you, but it terrifies me. 
every Christmas. Remember that bicycle that came flat packed from the catalogue? Remember the catalogues when, you were, when we were younger and your mum used to buy from the catalogue and, and she used to pay it off over 20 weeks and you'd get your chopper and, you, and, you'd, and you'd rush down and you'd see this sort of box flattened and you think, that doesn't look like a, doesn't look like a chopper, it doesn't look like a, a bike. And then you know, you'd rip off the, the and, and then you'd have to spend half a day getting the, uh, the handlebars sorted and the wheels straight and the seat on. Uh, at least I, I spent half a day, you may have done it in like a couple of minutes. Um, you might remember that piece of furniture that you bought your husband or your wife, you know, with uh, instructions in Swedish. <laughs> remember those? Yeah. Love those? Still love those, don't we? Love those, particularly when it's like two sentences and three pictures and you don't know which, which way the picture goes up. Maybe it might be a toy or a game that you've got to put together. We bought our grandson something called, what was it called, Marble Run? Oh, yeah. F fantastic game. Especially when I watch my son trying to put it together. <laughs> it takes him 45 minutes and, and Theo's bored with it in two after that, but it, hey, it's there. So assembly required. Frightening. For those of us less handy than others. Well, keep those words in mind as we begin today to navigate Exodus chapter 40. And at least in, if you've never put anything together, try and have some sympathy for the servant of God who was Moses. We know Moses, what a guy that he, he was. What a servant of the Lord. Not a perfect man. A man who had you know, gone on a great journey personally, as well as the journey through the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. He had his ups. Had a great start. God delivered him from death right at the beginning as a baby, didn't he? God uh, protected him and, and helped him take on all the wealth and all the, the knowledge of Egypt as he grew. Knowing that he was a special lad who was going to save or deliver the people. He knew that. The New Testament tells us that he had that in mind. He had it in mind so much that he tried to do it his own way. And he tried to intervene in a, a fracas between two people. And of course, he, was, he, he, was, he, had to, he had to kill someone. And then that was brought up to his memory the next day. And he had to run for his life. So we know that Moses had his ups and downs. We know he's seen some amazing things. We spent a lot of time in Exodus 34 where, as he stood on the mountain and God paraded his goodness before him. We heard as, as, as God gave him the, the plans for the tabernacle. Exodus 25 onwards. We've seen as he and with Bezalel and Aholiab supervised the production. They actually made everything according to the pattern. We marveled last week at the outrageous obedience that, that, that the people of Israel did, fueled by God's grace, fueled by God's goodness. Well, now he's got to put it all together. Now, if you like, that massive jigsaw has, has to be put in place, and it has to be put together, not only in the right place, it has to be put together in the right order. And as we go through this whole chapter, if you want to, if you want to title... If you, if you write the notes, if, if you want a title for the whole chapter, you could call it From Flat Pack to Fulfillment. Because that's what's arranged in front of Moses. For as we'll see in the, or, through the final chapter of this epic book, it tells us that God's plan, executed in the life of Moses and the people of Israel, actually does come to fruition. It actually comes to pass. God has, throughout the book, made himself known. He's made himself known by saving this special people for his own glory. He's come to display his glory before his people. He's adopted them, even despite the golden calf incident. He's entered into covenant with them. And the fulfillment of all that plan is that God would dwell with his people. That God would dwell in, with his people in this tabernacle and that's where the book ends that's where we'll get to in verse 34 to 36 of this book we'll get to the point where it all falls into place God's glory is displayed the people know that God lives with them they can see it they can hear it they move they are directed in their journeys according to God's presence and friends that was good news for them 
Because they're like you and I. We're sometimes wayward, oftentimes sinful, oftentimes, you know, had problems of their own and problems within their community, but they've been given, thanks to, by God's grace, not only God's presence in their midst, but a way of approaching him by means of sacrifice. Forgiveness for their sins was available. And they could stand seeing, if you like, a sense of God's glory. That's how the book ends. But you know, more than that, more than that, as we approach the end of the book, we have to know that that's not only how that book ends, it's how the whole Bible ends. It's how the whole of human history ends. It's even how your life, if you know Jesus Christ as your saviour, if you've repented of your sin and put your faith in him and you've been baptised as a declaration of that, then you know that your life will end in, in a sense in that same way. You might think, is my life going to end? Well, it might end physically, but don't worry because it's not going to end essentially because you're going to go to be with Christ. Or if we're here after Christ returns, we're just going to be transformed and we'll have a physical existence in eternity. So the good news is about the end of our life is that it won't end. It's not going to end. Faith in Christ. Faith in his work on the cross. The presence of his spirit that has regenerated us and made us new people. By means of that we are going to see the fulfilment of God's plan in the larger sense. We're not going to stand outside the tabernacle in the middle of a of, a, of the Palestinian desert or the Arabian desert and see fire at night or a pillar of cloud, what are we going to see? We're going to see the Lord. Yeah. We're going to have the beatific vision. We're going to see Christ face to face. We're going to stand before him face to face and see him. Even as he's portrayed in all his glory in the book of Revelation, we're going to see him. We're going to stand and see the dawn of a new heaven and a new earth. Our feet are going to stand on the dawn of a new day, a new heaven, a new earth that's all been created and manifests mm -hmm. the unabated glory of God. Amen. Now that's better than last Christmas. It's even better than next Christmas. You see, just as Moses saw the fulfilment of the plan of Exodus, just as the people saw the fulfilment of the plan there, so we will see, because of our faith in Christ, and because of his grace to us in that, we will see God's glory not made manifest in a tent, but made manifest eternally. And so these texts and these scriptures have worth to us because we can see what was required then and we can take principles out of there and so we understand how we are to live today. So before you get overcome with, the, with thoughts of eternity, let's have a look at the chapter. Just very quickly. How do we break this chapter down? How do we navigate it? We're not going to do it all today. Um, but if you look at the first eight verses, what do you see? In a sense, you see the program. You see God speaking again to Moses. You know, we should be used to that. All the way through the, the, the major sections, the major narrative, the major demonstrations of God's power and saving mercy have, have been accompanied with the Lord said. The Lord spoke. And that reminds us in Exodus really of Genesis, where, the, where, where our God is the God of creation. That's why God's word is always important to us, folks, because God's word creates and conditions reality. What is reality in its truest sense? I'm not going to get all philosophical, I can't even say that word, philosophical on you. But, God, but reality is what God says it is. It's not what you think it is, not what I think it is. It's not what we might feel about it. Reality is what God says it is. You know those mornings you get up and you don't feel as if you're a Christian anymore. You know, you, you don't feel as if, you know, you're that, you, you know you're, you're, you don't, there's not a sense of you know, distance between you and God. Is that real? No, it's not. That, that's your perception. That's your perception of the communion you have with God. But it's not reality because God has said that he will never leave us. Yeah, his union with us is sure because it's, it's, he, we, he has united us with Christ. And that's unbreakable. And you might say, well, you know, can I, can I not jump out? No, you can't. You didn't jump in. <laughs> to be honest, you, you didn't jump in, so you can't jump out. You were drawn in. 
Yeah, yes, you had decisions to make. Yes, you had a, a turning of your life around to do. Yes, you had repentance to do. But where did that come from? Did that come out of your strength and your ability? No, it didn't. It was a gift of God. God grants repentance unto life. God grants faith. It's a gift of God so that none of us can say, look what I've done. And I grant. Paul repeats it in Ephesians 2 time and time again. You know, by faith you are saved. By faith you are saved. And that, not of yourself. That, not of yourself. But in these first eight verses, we'll see the programs. And the priority there, as we'll come to in a minute, is that, is that God speaks again. And friends, the wonder of that is, is that God speaks to us. Not only to Moses, not only to Israel, not only in the time of Jesus, but today. If you will, but here God speaks. What did, what did Hebrews say to us? In the writer of Hebrews, he says to the people, don't harden your hearts. But listen, hear. Hear what God has to say to you. Because it's that word that God speaks that changes your life. It's that word that God speaks that creates and conditions the reality that you live in. And sometimes, you know, all we have to do, we talked about this on Thursday, Bible studies, didn't we? We have to re-enchant our hearts with the truth that we know about God and his ways, his grace and his goodness. Yeah, and that re-enchantment, you know, that, that getting excited, that, that magic, if you like, if you call it that. Yeah, of, of turning our eyes upon Jesus, turning away from sin, turning away from disappointment, turning away from distraction, turning away from discouragement and turning our eyes on Jesus. It's part of what it is to encourage ourselves in the Lord. It's part of what it is to function as a Christian in response to God's word. So yeah, in first eight, you have the program and we'll look at that in a sec. Then in verses 9 to 15, you have the fact of what, once it was all built, you have to prepare it. Anointing was necessary. Anointing with, with, with the holy anointing all was necessary, not only for the, the tabernacle and the utensils, but for the people who were to walk in it. Preparation was vital. Could not just walk into God's presence unprepared. What happens when sinful people walk into God's presence unprepared? Well, the, the Bible is full of what happens. And we read those accounts of people, you know, falling on their face at best and sometimes dying in God's presence. And we think, oh, that's a bit rough, isn't it? That's a bit harsh. Poor, you know, poor Ananias and Sapphira. You know, poor, you know, poor, poor Nadab and Abihu. But how many times have I, walked in, have I almost walked into God's presence or tried to walk into God's presence? And yet he's been gracious to me. You know, those instances remind us of the, the, the holiness of God. But the fact that we are still living, the fact that I'm still living, is, a, is an instance of God's grace. But preparation is needed. Verse 16 to 33. What happens? Moses does and builds and creates and anoints according to the passion. Look at verse 16. It says, so Moses did according to what the Lord had said. Verse 33, you know, um, he said, what does it say in verse 33? So he finished the work. What a day that must have been for Moses and the people of Israel. And in, and in those um, the first three sections, we're going to see seven commands in the first eight verses. Seven times God says, you shall do this. Then in the, second, in, in the second section, we're going to see another seven. You shall do this. You shall anoint them. You shall do this. And then in terms of that third section, the pattern, Moses shows, in a sense, this picture of obedience by doing it. And he says, as the Lord had commanded him, how many times do you think it is? Seven. Yeah, that, that, that idea of, of, of a completion of the obedience that was set before him. And then verses 34 and 36, we'll finish off by looking at the presence of of God in the midst of his people. So what about this, this first section or two? Just what are the thoughts for us to think about as we hear God's word today? Well, in, in some senses, it's as we've heard all the way through. Firstly, and I'm not going to belabor it, there's the primacy of God's word. Before every stage in the life of God's people, God speaks. God creates God's people. God's word creates God's people, not the other way around. Throughout the, throughout the, the story 
of creation in Genesis, God speaks. In terms of the plan of redemption, from Genesis 3 right through to the coming of Christ, God speaks first. God takes the initiative, even, even with you, even with me. You know, there was a time when we were separated from God, as, as it says in the New Testament, alienated, without hope and without God in a world that didn't really care about us. And neither did we care about others. But time and time again in the New Testament, we say, but God, what God did, God intervened, God spoke, God took the initiative with us. So here again, you see it in that first section where Moses, if you like, is, receives the program of building the tabernacle. It's been planned, it's been, it's been constructed, now it's being built. In that program, God, again, takes priority. He takes primes, he, he speaks. Again, that seven there, you could, as we argued back in chapter 25, in a sense has a, has a hint back to Genesis and the seven days of creation. In the tabernacle, God is recreating the world. In microcosm. He's recreating the place where God dwells and reigns. In the beginning in, in Genesis, God walked, as it were, in the garden. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. The picture was of fellowship. Here the picture is of God's presence with his people and fellowship restored. Fellowship restored and as the priests went in to do their work, they would see pictures that would remind them of creation. Pictures on the, on the, on the tent, pictures in the, the holy place that would remind them of God's power, God's primacy, God's purpose. Even God's purpose in creating man in the first place. Secondly, we see the, we see the principle See the principles of propriety in the worship of God. You know, time and time again, people have even written books titled this. What does Moses do here? He builds, he constructs, he consecrates, he anoints all according to the pattern. So that God's people can approach, not as they would wish to, in a sense, not haphazardly, but they can have a valid an open means of approach through the way of sacrifice. I've said it many times. How do we approach God today? Well, we come as we are, but not as we like. We come as we are. We have nothing to give him. We sang a song that says that, doesn't it? That we, we come to a king who needs nothing. Yeah. You know, God is not some needy being, you know, perched behind a rock somewhere, thinking, oh, I wish people would love me. I wish people would think about me. I wish people would, you know, maybe pray at me once in a while. It gives me such a buzz when they do that. That might be our picture of God, but that's not the God of the Bible. He is perfectly blessed and happy. He's perfect in all his ways. He's transcendent over the whole universe. He's worthy of praise and glory. All creation is by him and for him. Even we ourselves. And God speaks to a people who don't deserve it, like you and, like you and, you and I, and he gives them a way of approach. But you've got to do that. You've got to come that way. It's not if you feel like it. It's not if you agree with it or not. It's this is the way. Approach this way. And the principles here, uh, this being made according to pattern, this being, this being all templated out and constructed in such a way and built and anointed and, and consecrated, is all according to the pattern that God has given. Thirdly, in those first couple of sections, you have the, the priority of consecration. That for those who served in the tabernacle, anointing, consecration was necessary. Couldn't be just as, you know, couldn't be, oh, I've, I've woke up late, I'll just go. They had to wear the right th clothes. Clothes which again, what did, what did the clothes speak of when we talked about it? They spoke of the righteousness of another. Yeah, the whole tabernacle, the very garments of the high priest and the priest, they spoke of a righteousness that they as people did not possess. It pointed, as it said in Hebrews there, even Moses himself in, in talking about it and giving the instructions pointed to something that was better that was yet to come. 
and even Moses' own faithfulness. At the end of his journey, you know, a guy who's displayed wonderful meekness of character, a capacity to be faithful, not perfect, but faithful. Even all his life points to something else. Or indeed, should I say, points to someone else. Points to the, the one who would be faithful, not as a servant in building God's tabernacle, but as a son. It's amazing, isn't it, when you, when you read the experience of Moses. All that he saw, all that he did, but he didn't enter the promised land. All that he saw and all that he did, but he didn't fully see the glory of God in Christ. He had glimpses and, you know, that time on, on the top of Sinai, yeah. He didn't, in a sense, possess what we possess in Christ Jesus. In terms of the programme, the programme here, the programme of assembly was according to the pattern. The preparation of the priest was according to the pattern. And Moses, as we'll look at perhaps next week, 16 verses 30, what does he do? He does the, he does the work. And again, enabled by God's grace. And that sets the, sets the scene for God's glory. Amen. 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 We're going to respond. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's respond to God's word. As we look to the table of the Lord. We have such a privileged position. As being part of the family of God. We have a father who has sent a son to become our salvation. We have a father and a son who have sent the spirit to be the guarantee of all that Christ has accomplished and all that is still in store for us. So we can hear God's word about the, pre the primacy of his word and the principle of right worship and the priority of consecration knowing that forever we have been set apart to Christ. But we want to live in the goodness of that. We want to live in the glory of that. We want to live in the excitement of that. We want our hearts to burn within us as we go through our days as believers. Well, let's re-enchant our hearts with the truth of the gospel.
going to continue in worship as we come to the Lord's table. Still a time for raising our hearts to the Lord where we can, and communing with Him. But it's also an act of obedience where we hear again the word that came from the Lord on the night when He was betrayed. That when He was betrayed, He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <coughs> Stewards are going to serve us. We invite you, if you know Christ as your Saviour, to join with us as we worship God around his table. We remind you of the call to consecration and a life lived in the light of God's grace. It's not a call to sinless perfection. But it's a call to the long road of obedience, whereby we honour Christ in all of life. So if you know of something that's burning between you and God still, then why not just confess that now, before God, and receive cleansing. If you're not a Christian here today, if you've not repented and believed in the gospel, then we ask you to let these emblems pass by. We'll honour you in that for your honesty. But please, we ask that you would look at us and see what this means to us and see the truth of the gospel, even as we demonstrate it in the breaking of bread and in the cup. Thank you.
Let's bow our heads as we pray. We worship God even as we pray. And as we bring those requests that have been given to us as part of our pastoral prayer, we commend them to the Lord. And it may be that you, you know, have a need today. Well, this doesn't exclude you. You know, maybe as I pray, you want to identify with that prayer. You want to stand and ask God to, to, to minister to you and to bless you. <coughs> then we can join together as we pray. Almighty and everlasting God. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can come to you again through the avenue of prayer. Lord, to ask for continued grace and mercy for us upon those we love, upon those who have particular needs, indeed upon the nation and upon the world. Lord, we remember today again your church scattered abroad. We remember our brothers and sisters in uh, moments of persecution and difficulty. We think of those, Lord, with particular needs, Lord, serving you across the nations. We think today of our local church fellowship. Lord, we again thank you for making us part of your purposes by joining us to a local body of believers. Lord, we pray that you would sustain us and help us to be faithful in these days. Lord, keep us faithful to the good news of Christ. Keep us faithful to the message, the only message that saves. Lord, keep us amazed by your grace, even as we go through our days. We pray for those who are laid aside in sickness. We pray for those even here who need a touch from you, Lord, or need a touch for, for, for one of their loved ones. Lord, we pray that your blessing, your healing word would go out in power, Lord, into places and situations. We pray for our sister Janet over in Hexham. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon her. We pray for our sister Hilary. Lord, away from us today, Lord, we pray you would raise her up, Lord, from that ailment. We pray, Lord, for our shut-ins in particular. Lord, she will receive this um, service on DVD and, and through the internet. Father, we pray for them that you would add your blessing to their watching. Father, we pray that you would once again, Lord, remind us of your love and mercy as we, as we progress into another, another week. We ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song. And just prior to a short benediction, we're going to receive our offering and the repayment of our tithes to the work of the Lord as we do that. So let's stand together. The tea and coffee is brewing as we speak. Jesus, my King, my wonderful Savior, all of my life is given to thee.
Now may the Lord of all glory, who fulfills his promise day by day until the day when we stand before him in a new heaven and a new earth, supply and sustain you even this week for your good and for his greater glory. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you.